And God forbid, it's a horrible tragedy to be born without the ability to hear and speak. But that cannot cause us, lead us to be naive to the fact that Helen Keller was an occult leader. Here is Helen Keller's own book published by the Swedenborg Foundation. Why would the Swedenborg Foundation, an occult foundation, why would they publish her book, Light in My Darkness? Helen Keller says, Swedenborg teaches us that love makes us free. That's occult love. That's satanic love. We become masters. Notice, see, Satan, masters. The symbol of independence, the force. Creators of good. We discover in ourselves many undeveloped resources of will and thought. That's a New Age statement. That's a, that is an occult statement. The God within, the force within. It goes back to the mystics throughout the centuries. Jacob Beam and others. Swedenborg. Who is this Swedenborg that she says teaches us about this love that makes us free? Swedenborg, who died in 1772, declared that the second coming of Christ was the revelations he received to give to the world. Where did he get these so-called revelations? He professed that he was communicating with spirits from the planet Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, Saturn, Venus, and the moon, and beyond. He denied salvation through faith alone. John Wesley lived in his day and called him a madman, a society of lunatics, blasphemous nonsense, a filthy dreamer. He says, let these dreams sink into the pit from which they came. John Wesley writes about Swedenborg in one of his magazines and says, Swedenborg's hair stood upright and he foamed a little at the mouth. He said he was the Messiah. He then undressed himself and rolled in very deep mud. Helen Keller discovered Swedenborg at age 16. She goes on to say, Since I was 16 years old, I have been a strong believer in the doctrines of Emmanuel Swedenborg. Why should I change my faith? I have a profound respect for the teachings of Baha'u'llah. I am a Swedenborgian. The other man that she mentioned here is the founder of the Baha'i religion that's bringing all religions together in one occult New Age religion. So, Helen Keller was an occultist. That's why they call her a theosophist, which is really theosophy in modern times. It's really just the old Gnosticism. Uh, theosophy was founded by H.P. Blavatsky, who edited the magazine Lucifer, Lucifer Magazine. Notice what Blavatsky says in her Theosophical Glossary. Of all mystics, Swedenborg has certainly influenced theosophy the most. So, here is Helen Keller embracing this man, this devil-possessed man, who the theosophists who follow Lucifer believe is the greatest of all occult mystics. She says his clairvoyant powers, however, were very remarkable. And she goes on to define clairvoyance as the faculty of seeing with the inner eye. So that's why this triangle with the eye, the, the eye is starting to be a popular symbol now that is appearing everywhere. It represents the spiritual sight, the occult sight, the awareness of your divinity. The faculty which so remarkably was so remarkably exercised by Jacob Beam and Swedenborg. Jacob Beam is the one Isaac Newton followed and has been the mystic that has influenced so much of occultism in this modern day. But notice, she says, Jacob Beam and Swedenborg. So, Swedenborg was an occult mystic and Helen Keller embraced his teachings. And she did not just embrace his teachings. She lived and breathed and communicated and propagated those teachings. Here's a picture of Helen Keller when she was older. Look at her now. Uh, 
Notice as she touches her chin, she's making the horned hand sign. No thumb, the horned hand sign. In 1927, New York Times says Miss Keller makes it clear that she is an ardent believer in the new church or Swedenborgianism. Helen Keller again in the book My Religion in 1927 says the 18th century out of which grew the titan genius of Emanuel Swedenborg, faith alone was exalted and not faith either, but a self-centered assumption that belief alone was necessary to salvation. So whatever you say, Helen Keller did not believe in salvation through faith alone. She did not believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. His Swedenborg's message has traveled like light side by side with the new science, the new freedom, and the new society. I am aware of encouraging voices that murmur from the spirit realm. She says, I'm also hearing those same type of voices. How could I worship three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? No one who believes in God and lives right is ever condemned. So here she's denying the Trinity, denying salvation through faith alone. She's denying hell and the everlasting lake of fire for those who do not embrace the gospel. She goes on to tell us Isaac Newton, who was like-minded with him. So she at least knows that this new science and many of these things came from the same type of mysticism that Swedenborg embraced, the devil possession of men like Jacob Beam and Swedenborg, who came later. As Newton was inspired to see the laws of attraction in the physical realm, Swedenborg perceived that love is the corresponding attractive law in the spiritual realm. So to an occultist, love is the attracted force. It is the force. It is the spirit of Satan. It's love for self. No other man highly trained in all the sciences of his time has ever asserted that he was in constant intercourse with another world for more than a quarter of a century. So she's saying this man had spirits that he was able to talk to. A divinely inspired interpreter. The literal statement of the scriptures is an adaption of divine truth to the minds of people who are very simple. So she says don't follow the Bible literally because that's foolish. I have had abundant opportunity to learn how defective the sense of the letter is in the light of modern science. So she's embraced evolution. She doesn't believe the Bible is a true statement. She says you have to read the Bible in a Swedenborgian sense. You have to read the Bible in an occult sense. There is a meaning beneath the letter that cannot be read in word but only in symbol. The inner or mystic sense, if you like, gives me a vision of the unseen. So Helen Keller was an occultist. Keller supported Dr. Hazelden. She was a personal friend of Margaret Sanger, who founded Planned Parenthood and was a Nazi supporter. Helen Keller was also a nationalist socialist. Her friend Margaret Sanger taught that Australian aborigines were only one step more evolved than chimpanzees, and they were just under blacks. Sanger's paper was the woman rebel, no gods, no masters. There's that satanic spirit. Helen Keller says that her favorite periodical was the National Socialist. Who was this Dr. Hazelden that Keller supported? On November the 12th, 1915 in Chicago, there was a severely deformed baby boy that was born. The head surgeon was Dr. Harry J. Hazelden. Hazelden convinced the mother not to treat the child and to let it die. This was a common practice for Hazelden. You see this today in this abortion where they are directly killing infants in the womb. You see it in hospice where somebody that they believe is not fit to live is allowed to die of thirst with no nourishment, no water and to sit there and wither away and dry up, and they call it compassion. Dr. Hazelden took the story to the press in a full-blown propaganda campaign for euthanasia, so-called mercy killing, and eugenics, which is supposedly guarding the gene pool, keeping undesirables from procreating. 
That's what abortion is about today in the eyes of these Planned Parenthood eugenics. It's Nazism in a different package. Hazelden made a movie, The Black Stork, with Hearst, about saving society from such defectives. Hazelden said that he let defectives with lives of no value die because he loved them. There it is. There's your Helen Keller love. There's the occult love. We need to kill a lot of people. It's love for Mother Earth. Charles Darrow was the attorney of the Scopes trial in the 1920s, the great evolution trial that they used as propaganda to try to make Christians appear ignorant. Well, Darrow was the attorney, the prosecute, I'm sorry, the defense attorney, and he said that society should chloroform unfit children, show them the same mercy that has shown beasts who are no longer fit to live. Helen Keller went on to write an article or a letter which was printed in the New Republic in 1915 to defend Dr. Hazelden. She says, much of the discussion aroused by Dr. Hazelden when he permitted the Bollinger baby to die centers around a belief in the sacredness of life. If many of those that object to the physician's course would take the trouble to analyze their idea of life, I think they would find that it means just to breathe. Surely they must admit that such an existence is not worthwhile. It is the possibilities of happiness, intelligence, and power that give life its sanctity. And they are absent in the case of a poor, mishappen, paralyzed, unthinking creature. So she's playing God. In the jury of the criminal court, we have an institution that is called upon to make just such decisions as Dr. Hazelden made to decide whether a man is fit to associate with his fellows, whether he is fit to live. A mental defective, on the other hand, is almost sure to be a potential criminal. The evidence before a jury of physicians, considering the case of an idiot, would be exact and scientific. Conservatives ask too much perfection of these new methods and institutions. We can only wait and hope for better results as the average of human intelligence, trustworthiness, and justice arises. Meanwhile, we must decide between a fine humanity like Dr. Hazelden's and a cowardly sentimentalism. So Helen Keller is saying, basically, when we finish with the gene pool, when we finish with our Nazi techniques, when we finish with our eugenics and our euthanasia and our sterilization programs, when we finish making sure only the good and the fit breed, then we will end up with this perfect world. And that is Helen Keller's love, is a Swedenborgian occult love. It is a demon-possessed, devil-possessed love. It is a love that the abortion, the, the abortionists at Planned Parenthood use today. It is the love of euthanasia and eugenics. It is not a love from Jesus Christ. It is not a love that is in the Bible other than the secret, wicked, satanic love that the Bible warns us about. An article in Wikipedia says that resident students of deaf schools from the early 20th century do not recall seeing the sign anywhere until the 1970s. What they are saying is, when they went and interviewed elderly people, they said, when did you first see this horned hand, supposedly meaning, I love you, when did you first see that? They say, I don't remember seeing that till the 1970s. I have searched over and over and over, and I can find nowhere before the 1970s in picture or in book. I'm not saying that it's not out there somewhere, but I can find nowhere where this symbol meant I love you until the 1970s, after the Beatles, after the Black Sabbath heavy metal rock and roll singers and others were using it plainly for the occult. After the Church of Satan adopted it as Satan, the symbol of love and liberty. Therefore, when people say it just means I love you, you can say, yes, it does. It means I love you in satanic language. It means I love you in the Helen Keller Nazi sense of I love you. It means I love you in the sense of I want you to uh, follow Satan and search for your own godhood.
So let's go back and study Charles Babbage, 1791 to 1871. Charles Babbage, Wikipedia, considered a father of the computer. Babbage is created with inventing the first mechanical computer. Okay? Primer Magazine, if you use a computer, you have Charles Babbage to thank. Velocity Guide, Charles Babbage is popularly acknowledged as the father of computing. AskTheComputerTech.com, the first mechanical computer was invented by a mathematics professor in Cambridge, England named Charles Babbage. Charles is even considered by many people worldwide to be the father of the modern day computer because of his con uh, inventions of the mechanical computing engine. All right, it's pretty important, I believe, if the Lord said, Know of whom thou hast learned them. I think it's very important for us to look and see who gave us this information. Now, I will give a disclaimer for a moment. Some of the root technology was invented by not only Christians, but fundamental Christians. If you go and study Faraday, a King James Bible believing premillennial Christian uh, that had so much in common with what we do today. I mean, they even, they even went to church on Thursday and had lunch after church on Sunday. I mean, it was just a little strange. But that's where you got electricity from as, as far as the modern uh, understanding of, of some of the ways to harness it from. Morse was a great premillennial leader with the Morse code. And so a lot of the things that developed were from Christians opening their Bible and serving God. But you listen to me. There is some satanic inspiration involved in a lot of what we see today as well. And so I'm just going to give you the information and you do with it what you think. But I do want you to fear the Lord and I want you to prepare yourself and arm yourself against what the devil's trying to do. All right, who's the father of the computer? Babbage. Let's go back from Charles Babbage's writings. That's what I say. See, if somebody tells me Charles Babbage is the father of computing, I want to obey Second Timothy and find out. Let me see who this man was. Let me see what he said. Let me see what he believed. Passages from the life of a philosopher, 1864, Charles Babbage says this, I gathered all the information I could on the subject. He's talking about the devil. And I was soon informed that there was a particular process by which the devil might be raised and become personally visible. I carefully collected from traditions of different boys the visible forms in which the prince of darkness had been recorded to have appeared. After long thinking over the subject, although checked by a belief that the inquiry was wicked, my curiosity at length overbalanced my fears and I resolved to attempt to raise the devil. Naughty people, I was told, had made written compacts with the devil and had signed them with their names written in their own blood. And they had become very rich and great men during their life, a fact which might be well known. But after death, they were described as having suffered and continuing to suffer physical torments throughout eternity. Another fact to which to my uninstructed mind, it seemed difficult to prove. Having closed the door, and I believe opened the window, I proceeded to cut my finger and draw a circle on the floor with the blood which flowed from the incision. I then placed myself in the center of the circle and either said or read the Lord's Prayer backwards. This I accomplished at first with some trepidation and in great fear toward the close of the scene. I then stood still in the center of that magic and superstitious circle, looking with intense anxiety in all directions, especially at the window and at the chimney. My uninstructed faculties led me from doubts of the existence of a devil to doubts of the book and the religion which asserted him to be a living being. Now, this man thinks that when he sat down, shed his blood and did a satanic ritual, he says the devil didn't show up. And then all of a sudden he said, so I don't believe in the devil. I don't believe in the Bible. And I believe that none of it's true. Hey, I think the devil did show up. But I don't think he manifest himself with horns and hoofs and a pitchfork. I think the devil showed up. And who knows, he might have even got possessed. 
1865, the British Quarterly Review says the Ghost Club, the Lunatic Club, is what people called it. Doubts respecting the existence of a devil led to Mr. Babbage's doubts respecting the authenticity of the Bible. It sounds like the devil was involved in that. How about you? You say, how do you know the devil? Because when the devil came to Eve, he said, hath God said? Doubt the authenticity of the Bible. Then he said, thou shalt not surely die. So Mr. Babbage, here he is. He doesn't believe in the Bible. He doesn't believe in anything that he has to fear. Then when he says, nor will it astonish any reader to learn that. When at Cambridge, Mr. Babbage and some of his college companions formed themselves into a ghost club and made it their duty to collect evidence on the subject of apparitions. If they heard of a phantom, these spiritual detectives speedily put themselves in pursuit. What was Babbage doing? Now, I believe this is before West Cotton Hort's ghost club that's also at Cambridge. But you need to understand that all of these new Bibles came from Westcott and Hort text. And Westcott and Hort had a ghost society where they sat around and performed seances. And when a medium was possessed and would begin to speak all of her mess, they would investigate it as they sat around the seances. Your new Bibles come from that wickedness. But this is Babbage having a ghost club as he sits around and performs seances, talks to spirits. And then guess what happened? he starts getting inspiration for a computer. And it starts coming to him. And he starts forming it out and thinking it. That ought to give you a little bit of fear. When you begin to consider how the devil's using that technology today. I know it can be used for good. But you have to beware of how the devil intends to use her. And you have to beware. Because if you do not get on guard about this subject, you're going to end up Being destroyed by the devil. There was one more man that's called the father of the computer, and he picked up where Babbage left off. His name was Alan Turing. He died in 1954. He's called the father of computer science. He was a homosexual, he was an atheist, and he killed himself by cyanide. In 1954, it's interesting that Apple Computer has a logo with what's traditionally in fable said to be the forbidden fruit. And they have a logo with a piece of that apple missing. That's not all. The apple is covered in the rainbow which we know is a symbol of God's mercy and covenant with man, but has been used today in perversion by the homosexuals. What Apple did was flip the colors of the rainbow upside down and gave them in reverse order. So you have an apple with a piece missing which is basically the pursuit of rebellious godhood. Then you have a 
backwards rainbow. And of course, they love to say, oh, we didn't mean anything by it. Oh, they're making too much money off of Christians. But there's something about that symbol. They said there's nothing that they've ever seen that has ever been used by a company that people wanted to get tattooed all over their body. But all around the world, people are taking that symbol of the Apple computer and they're getting it tattooed. They're putting it on their car. They're putting it on their t-shirt and on their body itself. I think it's plain that anybody can see there is a satanic agenda going on here. And the devil loves to communicate in images and pictures and everybody knows what it means. You could tell a bunch of gullible Christians, oh no, the guy who designed it said it was just an accident they stumbled on it. You can believe that nonsense if you want to. I wonder if you would walk around with an upside down cross on your shirt. Would you do that? Would you allow one in your house? But you'll allow Eve's apple glorified. I know it wasn't an apple, but they think it was. It's still a picture of man's antichrist rebellion. The ultimate picture of we are going to obtain godhood by our own technology. Let's fast forward to Thomas Edison, who died in 1931, inventor of the phonograph, the motion picture camera that I said was quickly used for perversion. It got so bad that uh, the nudity and horrible violence and perversion got so bad that they had to come up with a code and that drove all the perversion underground. And finally you ended up where lust didn't satisfy anymore. They had to mix it with violence. That was the 60s. And then finally, that didn't satisfy anymore. So in the 70s, they had to mix it with torture. People actually go and eat popcorn and watch people be tortured. Folks, where are we at now? 80s, 90s, 2011. Where are we at now? Where you're at is you've got a bunch of perverts running that street out there like you have never hardly seen on the face of the earth. Maybe in the days of Noah is about the only time. And they're after little kids. Thomas Edison, you've learned about Thomas Edison in public school, right? Oh yeah, you've been, you've had Thomas Edison stuffed down your throat. Thomas Edison, Thomas Edison. The man who wrote Natural Pet Healing, our psychic spiritual connection says, you need to understand that a number of incredible respected people have been members of the Theosophical Society through the years. They include American inventors such as Thomas Edison. And the man also that wrote the Wizard of Oz series of books. They're proud that Thomas Edison was a member of their Theosophy Club. Now, what was Theosophy? Theosophy was a satanic organization. Their magazine was Lucifer Magazine. Blavatsky was a medium in touch with spirits. And Blavatsky basically cut her hair off and put britches on and basically uh, said that I am in contact with spirits through automatic writing. And a lot of people started uh, trying to get in touch with her and learn from her. And Thomas Edison became a disciple of Blavatsky. In Theosophy magazine of 1925, it says Thomas Edison is one of the early members of the parent Theosophical Society. You can see his actual card of a member of the Lucifer Society. You can see his Lucifer Club card. Go back to 1921, Francis Grierson, Psychophone Messages. It says the, the word psychophone was first suggested and used by Mr. Francis Gerson in a lecture I heard him deliver before the Toronto Theosophical Society in 1919, one year before Thomas Edison announced his intention of devising an instrument which he hopes will serve to establish intercourse between our world and the world of spirit. What was Thomas Edison working on before he died?
and the world of spirit. What was Thomas Edison working on before he died? He already got the phonograph. He said when he actually got a voice to play back, they just kind of jumped back and were afraid. But he, he would get this inspiration and, and get these ideas. And, and before you know it, he's putting pictures on camera, on film. And then he said, my last final dream is to get in touch with the spirit world. I'm going to have a machine that will actually trap spirits. Lucifer Magazine of 1890. Lucifer Magazine says one of the leading minds of the day is beyond dispute that of Thomas A. Edison, whose inventive powers have dispelled forever the secrets of the darkness. Edison will stand out prominently as one of the most remarkable products of evolution through repeated incarnations and the present century has been blessed with. That the present century has been blessed with. According to our belief, these peerless gifts of his had their beginning in some former life. Edison never had more than two months of schooling, but he had training at home from a mother. Before he was ten years of age, he had read several standard works of history and literature. It is said Edison dreams during sleep of his inventions. You've got some good things. Number one, that the man never went to public school. That the man was homeschooled. That the man was able to sit back and read at 10 and 11 and 12. He didn't have the motion picture mess that he invented to, to mess up his schooling, see. But uh, nevertheless, there's something more going on here than just wit and intelligence. Napoleon Hill, who makes witchcraft popular, how to win friends and influence everybody, he wrote a book in 1971 says you can work your own miracles. That sounds like you're a god, doesn't it? Mr. Edison discovered that when he concentrated his thoughts upon an idea he wished to perfect, he could tune in and pick up from the great reservoir of boundless ether thoughts related to that idea which had been previously released by others who had thought along the same line. Mr. Edison believed that the energy with which we think is a projected portion of infinite intelligence. I mean, this is fruity stuff. Crazy stuff. In 1878, Blavatsky. Blavatsky the witch. Blavatsky, who was mentioned in the Harry Potter novels and whose theories and religion is sold to all of these children today in this day and age. Blavatsky wrote a letter in 1878 to Edison and said, I would have been glad to have given you a little glimpse of what lies beyond the threshold of physical science. I have no doubt but that you will do very well. You are one of the few scientific experimenters to whom we would care to have on our master role. Fraternally yours, Blavatsky. Madame Blavatsky hopes you will be able to dine with her on Thursday at 6 p.m. and will be pleased to explain to you something about the occult forces that you desire to know. To show you what Edison was working on before he died, in 1933, Modern Mechanics magazine says, Edison's own secret spirit experiments. Here is described one of his amazing secret experiments whereby he sought to lure spirits beyond the grave and trap them with super sensitive instruments. In 1920, Edison gathered a small group of scientists in his laboratory to witness his secret attempts to lure spirits. When the experiment was ready to begin, the spiritualists in the group of witnesses were called upon to summon from eternity the ethereal form of one or two of its inhabitants to walk across the beam. I've opened up a little bit of the door here where you can see that there's been some very, very dark satanic men involved in devil possession, involved in the occult, involved in the direct worship of Lucifer, involved in trying to seek Lucifer. And, and because they later supposedly became atheists or didn't believe the Bible, you think the devil cares? His whole point is for you not to fear God, so you'll go experiment with the occult. Now, I'd like to have you think about something for a moment. You got this video, you've got the computer, and you think we're so blessed in our generation. 
87% of university students polled have used webcams and such like for wickedness that's unmentionable from the pulpit. 87%. You like your technology? God said nothing will be restrained from them which they've imagined to do. So God tried to limit man getting satanic inspiration to go hurt himself more. You just have more ways to destroy your family than any other generation has ever had. By the end of 2004, there were 420 million pages of pornography on the Internet by less than 50 companies. 420 million pornography websites. That's 2004. In 2006, the internet pornography with your computer, video, Thomas Edison meets Babbage. And we now have a 12 billion, I didn't say million, I said billion dollar annual revenue that's in 2006. The largest group of viewers of Internet filth is children between ages 12 and 17. The folks that will be marrying your daughters and your sons. God forbid. I hope it's not found in your home. I hope you've done everything you can that if you choose to try to use this technology for good, I do pray that you'll have enough sense and enough boldness and enough manliness to make absolutely sure that your own soul and your wife and your children are absolutely protected. In 2005, 71.9 million people in that one year had visited lewd sites, which they said was almost half of everybody that searched the Internet. In 2005, half of the people that searched the Internet visited lewd, wicked sites. Now, child pornography has become a three billion annual industry. Every second, 30,000 people are viewing filth on the Internet. Every second. Every second, another 30,000. Every second, another 30,000 people. God looked down and He said, sorcery, fornication. As in the days of Noah. He only found Noah and his family perfect. The whole rest of the world had defiled themselves. One in three of those 30,000 every second that are viewing Phil are women. And none of this even deals with the email. Email is the secret way for you to be a pervert. You didn't ask for it to come across your screen. And I'm going to tell you something right now. If you're able to look at that filth, then you're in great bondage. You understand that? If you don't have it set up where that stuff automatically is deleted, then I would get off of email. You understand that? Because I know what you are doing. You are sitting here in your life living a double life. You understand that? You are a hypocrite. You're a vexed hypocrite. But you don't want to get rid of your email because you think you can sin and not have to feel guilty because you didn't ask for it. 
I wonder if God will buy the game. Y'all listening? Two point five billion emails every day are lewd. Beyond mentionable. Two point five every day. You know what the most popular day for it is? Sunday. Sunday. Sunday is the most popular pornographic day. The average age for the first, the first pornography on the internet is age 11. I got one verse for you. Matthew 18, verse 6. Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. The Lord says the punishment that you're going to have at the judgment seat of Christ, take the most grueling physical death that can be imagined upon this earth and you're going to have worse. Say, Lord, what did I do? You allowed your children to have a stumbling block. You allowed your children to get addicted and cursed. And you did not believe the verse that says a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. You didn't believe it. You forgot in the Bible a child is under 20. You forgot in the Bible that God said He's not mocked. Evil communications will corrupt good manners. He said, I can trust my children. How big of a fool are you? I've got pretty good children. I hope you're getting ready to go to hell. Are you listening? I don't know if I can put the fear of God in you or not, but I hope God's Spirit will put the fear of God in you. And I hope you'll realize you've been warned. And what I'm telling you right now is you need to get the stinking computer away from your children. You need to get it away from you unless you are sure that you can control it. Dear Lord, I do pray in the name of Jesus Christ. That folks will understand the wickedness that's in this world. We've tried to preach it in a seemly manner, Lord, while at the same time letting the truth be known. Lord, I know that fools will make a mock at sin and they'll laugh about all of this and they'll think it's no big deal, Lord, but we know the whole world's racing to hell. All right. They're killing little babies in the womb. What wickedness, Lord, is soon to come upon America. They're wondering why there's pedophiles everywhere, left and right, but nobody will stop and admit what we're doing to ourselves. The wicked movies that people watch, dear Lord, vexing themselves daily. God, I pray there'll be some people here that'd be willing to pluck their eye out, cut their hand off, do whatever it takes, Lord, to obtain Thy kingdom. We know salvation is by grace through faith alone. We thank You, Lord, for eternal salvation that can never be lost. But we know there's a terrible judgment for Christians coming if we will not live right. And Lord, You said to make not provision for the flesh. You said to do whatever we can. And Lord, I know there's a lot of things we can get rid of before we have to get rid of our eyes, Lord. Help this church be motivated to get serious about these gadgets that allow pornography to come into their hearts and homes. Please, Lord, please move upon this church 
to wake up. In the name of Jesus, amen.